Today is August 6th, and this is what I received this morning. My child, good morning. Listen to me, daughter. Today you will begin the next series of events. I want you to tell them I am getting ready to deliver on all my promises. The day of the Lord is indeed a dreadful day for those who are still sleeping. They will be led to the slaughter. They will not be able to go when I fill their hearts with knowing. They are going to become like the lamb led to the slaughter. They will have to die for my name's sake in order to gain access to the kingdom. Melissa, there are so many who believe they will be raptured. They believe they can live fully in the world and then be rescued out when it gets ugly. Melissa, the way to be raptured is to believe in me, to trust in me, to put all of your hope in me. Many believe they do this, yet they are married to this world. They have not given me their hearts at all. Melissa, find time to speak these words today. You can add them to yesterday's words. Please consider this, my children. Count the cost. What is it that you hold dear? What and who stands in my place? Forfeit all that keeps you from experiencing my love, my peace, my wisdom, my understanding. You do not want to be here after the rapture. You do not want to experience hell on earth. My children, it will become dark, so dark. The ones who remain will find out how to become like children again, but many will discover that I was never their father. My beloved sons and daughters, please pick up your cross and follow me. I will lead you to your father. I will take you back home. I will restore you and lift your head. I will finish my work in you. But you must begin your journey with me now. You must ask for me to forgive your sins now. You must admit you need a savior and you do not belong to this fallen world now. Children, time is short. I love you and I have spoken. The scripture I received is Genesis 2-1 and Genesis 5-1-8. through 8. Malachi 4-6, the Beatitudes. Hebrews 4-6. Hebrews 5.11, Deuteronomy 3.6, Philippians 2.4-6, Matthew 8.4, Song of Solomon 2.6, Proverbs 14.2, Ezekiel 36.2-1-12, 2 Timothy 2.11, 2 Timothy 3.1-7. 1 Corinthians 2.16, Amos 2.11 and 3.6, 1 Timothy 2.11. And I think in that case he's talking about the, the bride and the church possibly, or the church and, the, and, and God possibly, Jesus. Sing a new song, I am coming to set the captives free. So over the past couple of days, the Lord's been working on helping to clarify some things dealing with the soul and the spirit. And it, it's come up because I've been working with some, some people and talking with some people about deliverance and where the enemy has rights and, and doorways in and where he can hold us captive and those types of things. And before I was like getting ready to present information to them, I really wanted to have clarification of what is the difference between soul and spirit because a lot of people believe that they're the same thing. And so I was just praying about that and seeking him on that issue specifically. And I was actually um, going grocery shopping and I, I had to stop in the parking lot and, um, and write down a few things because he started speaking and it was really profound. So I was just asking him, Lord, what is the difference between the soul and the spirit exactly? What is the soul? He said, it's the place I created to show there is no life apart from me. The enemy has rights there. The soul is a mere reflection of death. The soul is a mere reflection of the fallen world. So the way that I understand it is the soul is kind of our inner reality our inner experience of, of the fallen flesh. And it's there, he says, to show that apart from spirit, there's no life there. And 
when I pursued things of this world and, and the Lord showed me, I mean, he let me dive deep into this world to reveal the, the, the truth of this. I've experienced it. I've experienced pursuing the things of this world until the deeper I got into it, the deeper it led into itself, but it was going nowhere. And the emptiness just kept growing inside of me as I filled myself with pleasures of the world, I actually felt emptier and emptier and emptier. I was experiencing the feeling of, of that. No life in that. I thought I was happy. I thought, I thought, you know, I had happy feelings. I had, um, like fleshly happiness and pleasures. You know, I, I lived, a life where I really pursued dance um, and when I accomplished I wanted to accomplish more I wanted to keep climbing 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 but it just kept taking me deeper and deeper and deeper into itself and what is at the end of that really and um, when the illusion started to burst when the idols started to fall I could see the lies and all of that and the emptiness of it and I just pictured being at the end of my life and that was my life that was the whole thing. Being accomplished in dance and teaching others dance, like, it just seemed so empty. And, you know, I would work, I was kind of a workaholic, and the more I worked, the emptier I felt. The more, like, I achieved, like, what I wanted to look like, and um, the level I wanted to be at, it wasn't, still wasn't enough. Like, I felt like I had to I had to, almost like there was expectation on me. I put it on myself, others, I felt it from others, and I just kept feeling like I had to live up to that expectation, and it was never enough. Like as I climbed, I got to the next level, that wasn't enough, I got to the next level. It just like, it just kept taking me deeper and deeper and deeper down that road. And where was it all going to go? Would it ever be enough? Um that's just one small example there's so many things like that you know I spent so much time in the commercial world of just like consumerism just shopping and and trying to have this certain identity in the world and it's all counterfeit you know it looks like life it sort of feels like life it gives you a boost um, but the enemy operates and it's a it's a counterfeit life it's a counterfeit light it's a counterfeit joy. It's not satisfying. But there, it kind of creates a mirror of the world. So your soul is kind of your inner reflection of what is in the world. Like you can study the created. And that's kind of what you do in your soul. You know, you, you worship the created thing. Um, your soul is like your personality, your feelings, your desires. Um... All of that you know I studied psychology in college and you can study your personality and you can study all the things that make you the way that you are and you can go to counseling and you can adjust things and and um, think that you're growing and you're getting better but the reality is I've experienced it in my own life Jesus is the way the truth and the life all the other stuff is counterfeit and it just takes you deeply into nowhere's land and so it's kind of the inner wilderness experience is how I'm, how I'm now starting to understand this. Your soul is the inner reflection of the wilderness that's in the world. You know, they pair together. So then I started to understand that the, the enemy operates in the fallen things, right? In the darkness. Our soul is unredeemed without Christ. It's fallen. It's got a death sentence it's really dead and um so the the enemy works in the in the soul he works in the world and that's kind of where he operates christ operates with spirit in spirit in truth the enemy operates in the lies and the counterfeits jesus is truth he's light 
Enemy is darkness. He's lies. He's, he, he has a counterfeit version of light. If you look at it, there's so many examples of that in the world. Like there's so many counterfeits. So many counterfeits of worship. So many counterfeits of healing. So many, I mean, he's got a counterfeit of laying on the hands healing. He's got a counterfeit of all the spiritual life and all the spiritual gifts and all the spiritual um, things. And he tries to lie to us and tell us our identity lies in our soul. Our identity lies in this world. And we, we believe it. And we make agreements with it. And those are the places he holds us captive. And those are the places where we develop idols. And we, we, we uh, worship the things that are created instead of the creator. So then I started to see that, you know, we are of a different kingdom. It's not this world. It's, it's a different kingdom. And that kingdom, you know, it, it lives inside of us, but it also exists outside of the veil, right? So the the kingdom is spirit and that's where our true identity lies and so he showed me and so I, I said help me understand even better what is spirit then so if that's the soul then how does spirit relate to that and he said write these words the soul is like the castle and the spirit is like the light so the spirit you know that reminded me of the scripture when when the enemy is cast out of a room or cast out of a home or whatever that scripture is and then he he goes and he leaves but then he comes back and he finds it all cleaned out and so he brings seven spirits back with him well what does that mean how is he allowed to do that well the light was never turned on in that area so you've got this empty room in your castle it's dark in there and the enemy has been hiding it and he's been dwelling there and he's got he's got a territory there well, when you cast that out and you sweep that out, it's important that you then replace what he stole, replace what he occupied with light, and you invite the Holy Spirit into that space. You turn the light on because the enemy cannot dwell where there's spirit. He cannot dwell where there's life. He cannot dwell where there's light. He cannot dwell where Christ is because Christ is life and light and in him there is no darkness so i was just starting to really in a profound way start to understand um you know we have to understand that christ in us unlocked our true identity we have to break agreements with the enemy when he says that we are those soulish things when we are when our identity can be found in the world, when our identity can be found in the logic of man, in the in this the the pursuit of things that are not Christ, that are fallen, that are Adam from Adam. And then I was reminded of uh, I had a vision on October twenty sixth that I journaled about. Right before I was falling asleep, I, I had a vision of the secret place where we're knit together. That's how I understood it. And it was like a, a seed. It was a small seed, and I was the seed. And it was surrounded by swirling energy and light. And it was love in a way that was so... I could hardly stand it. You know, I just was weeping as I was falling asleep. Like whatever that was, I just had tears streaming down my face. Well, when I woke up, those same swirling lights were writing on my wall, which reminded me of Daniel, you know, the story of the writing on the wall. And I was like, trying to read it. I'm like, I can't read it. Well, we can't read it. We can't read it without the revelation of spirit. We can't read any of it. We can't find our way around that castle. It's just wandering around in the darkness. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is all coming to me right now. So I said, Lord, I don't understand the writing on the wall because I hadn't learned the lesson yet, you know. Give me some words. And he did. He gave me five words and I had to go and write them down before I forgot. Revelation. P.A. Rosa is how I experienced it. When I looked that up, that's how it's, that's how the pronunciate, like the pronunciation of Perusia, P, like I looked up the 
you know how they teach you how to say something, how to pronounce it, and it's P-A-A-R-O-O-S-E-E-U-H. Uh, P-A rose a. Uh. <laughs> I I can't make this stuff up. Okay, so Perusia. But that's how it's spelled out. Okay, I don't know. I, I don't know if that made sense. I'll I'll write it in the notes so you can see. Psalm fifty-two. Pickaxe. Now, when I did a, a search in the Bible on pickaxe, it's only mentioned one time, and it's mentioned when. This is so so amazing. When King Solomon was building the temple, he said, I don't want to hear any tools, not even a pickaxe. So what that means and what the Lord has spoken to me in the beginning of my journey, all of a sudden I just woke up, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. I understood that that's what that meant. It was, he didn't want to hear the power and the might. He didn't want to hear the, the, the flesh working. It's all by spirit. So that's what happens when we are operating in flesh world, in soulish pursuits, operating with the enemy. We try to have our own separate rebellious identity, separate from God. It's no new tricks. It's what's been going on since the fall of man. This is exactly the same thing that happened, right? The enemy lies to us, tells us that we can figure out who we are apart from God, and we pursue our inner world, and in our wilderness experience, we have an inner wilderness and an outer wilderness, and we're wandering in the dark, right? And when the Spirit enters, we have a whole different identity. It's a seed that lies dormant inside of each person. And Jesus and, the, and our Father is the farmer, and he grows that seed and what lies inside of that dormant seed isn't recognizable. It's so skillfully and masterfully built in that secret place. And when you look at a seed, you can't imagine the plant that emerges from that seed. You can't imagine the plant, the plans and the, the design that's hidden in that. Well, that's what happens. Christ unlocks that in us. He unlocks our true identity. Our identity is hidden in Christ. That's what he did for us. He restored us to what we were supposed to be before the fall. And it's a whole different thing. You know, I know I'm, I majored in psychology. I know what my personality is on the Myers-Briggs. I know like what my identity is as a dance teacher. I know all of these things, but my true identity is so different. It belongs to a whole different kingdom. And, you know, I've, I, we're yet to discover what that truly looks like outside of the veil, like who we really are. But Christ unlocks that for us and starts to grow it. So it's like a seed that's inside of us all. It's dormant. And then when we start to grow in our identity, it's hidden in Christ. It has the mind of Christ and we're the body of Christ, right? It frees us from all of those things and it is life. It shows us the way. It turns the light on in the castle, you know? It's the way, the truth, and the life. It's truth. It's not... It's not counterfeit. It's actually, actually more real. It is the greater reality. It is the true reality. It is the reality. And then I heard the word. So there's five words that he gave me when I saw the writing on the wall. Revelation. P.A. Rosa. Perusia. Psalm 52. Pickaxe. And then outer court. So I'm not exactly sure yet what that means, but I'm, I'm thinking it probably has to do with, and he just hasn't given that part to me yet, but as soon as we enter the tabernacle, we are trying to, like the idea, the order of things brings us into his presence, which Perusia means his presence. It means the second coming. It means all the events of the second coming. Um, 
but it, the order of things in the temple we've talked about so much but it's getting us to a place where we're free and that it's all done by the spirit you know it's it's, it's teaching us who we are it's getting us to receive the spirit and then we can get instructed on who we are and then we can be free like and then we enter into the the holy of holies so it's like I, I see it, but it's hard to put into words. I will put those words in the in the notes, and you can think about it yourself and pray on these things. But uh, glory, Lord, like that was just an awesome, awesome time with him yesterday. Uh, just as he revealed deeper truths to me about soul and spirit in a way that I can really start to conceptualize it. I can maybe start to teach some people on it. Um, but I just... I know that the enemy knows his rights and he, and the church is, is sleepy on these things. They've not been taught these things. And now is the time, you know, that these things are coming out, these truths. And I, I just encourage you to, to spend time with the Lord, seek him on these things, discover for yourself the truth of this. So you can be free and you can invite the Lord into those spaces and that he can become um, really our God and we can get rid of the things that, that grip us because of our my people they suffer for lack of knowledge like that's a verse in there somewhere right so we can quit suffering so we can quit um, being held captive because of our ignorance so anyway um Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. He is the one who restores us back to our creator. He is our true identity. And um, he reveals to us truth. And, this, and the truth can be found hidden in the spirit. And it's there. It's there available. And, um, you know, he's coming. He's coming to set, set the captives free. And the ones that are still sleeping and the ones still in ignorance, there's just going to be a different story. And uh, I'm just increasingly feeling the burden on my heart for them. And I, I just, for, for the Lord's glory, um, just, you know, I want to help. I want to help. I want to be an instrument to bring truth, you know, into people's awareness and, uh, introduce Jesus in a, in a new way that maybe we haven't always understood just who he is and just who we are in him. So I love you all and uh, thank you for being here today and I will look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a great day.